Um, so it's going to be about a 40, 45 minute talk, uh, just giving you a quick uh, introduction to uh, our shiny. Um, so the, the basics of our shiny is that it allows you to write web applications using only R. So if you only know R, um, you can write simple web applications fairly quickly uh, using that language. There's no need for you to know anything like HTML or, HTML or JavaScript. So you can write applications only in R. If you do know HTML or JavaScript, you can interact it with R Shiny, but I'm not talking about that today. So I'm just talking about applications that you write only in R. Um, it's good for doing uh, simple web applications, it's good for communication, good for teaching, uh, and good for visualisation. So there is uh, a lot of information online. Uh, the first uh, web address there is a showcase of different uh, Shiny applications. And I'll be showing a couple of them uh, today. Uh, the next one is a tutorial. Um, it's a very good tutorial that you can go through on the web um, and very useful. And again, I'll be showing a couple of examples from that today. Uh, there is a book now available called Web Application Development Using R with Shiny. Um, it's quite a short book, according to Amazon, maybe about 100 pages, uh, so that may interest you as well, although I've never read it. Uh, but the online materials are very good. Uh, so really I'm just going through a few examples uh, in this session. So I'll go through a couple of showcase examples, just showing you the actual web applications. Uh, one on heights and weights of school children, another one on exploring a data set of uh, diamonds. Uh, the second part is the only part where I'm going to be showing you R code. So this is the how to do part. So I'll be going through three of the tutorial examples and showing you how you will write those examples yourself. Uh, so a kind of hello world example on uh, random samples and histograms. And a couple of more complicated examples. And so I'll show you all the code that enables you to do those three um, web applications. Uh, so the code part and the main part of this talk is in the centre. I'll then be showing you a couple of my own examples, one on Australian maps of fire danger indices, and a second one on a co-authorship network of CSIRO scientists. Okay. So, The first thing to do is to make sure you've got a shiny package, uh, which is obviously a necessity, so do make sure you load that in. And I'll talk about these, uh, the code I'm using a bit later, um, but I'm just going to show you a couple of applications first. So here's a modelling application. I'm not connected to the internet here, so I'm doing this locally on my machine. So if I run that code, which I'll, I'll talk about later, it, opens up my local browser and it gives me the uh, web application. So it's, you can kind of see that it's a, quite a simple application, which is what our Shiny does. This is the standard setup of our Shiny. Uh, so what you have is obviously you have your header, um, you have a sidebar on the left hand side, uh, and you have the main panel on the right hand side. So using uh, Shiny terminology, uh, the header is in the header panel. Uh, the sidebar on the left, that's the sidebar panel. And on the right hand side, where your output is, that's your main panel. So in this case, the output is a plot. Uh, you can't see the uh, points very well, they're quite small, but in this case, I don't have a means of making them bigger because that's not in the application. So you have to just deal with that. So you can see on the left hand side, what have I got? I've got a few drop down lists, so I've got a data set with three variables, and I can choose the variables to plot. So instead of plotting, age versus height, uh, I could plot, for example, uh, weight and height. Like that. Um, so I can choose the x or y variable in the drop-down list. I can also use these sliders to limit the range. So I've got some sliders here as well. All the sliders do in this application is just really cut off the points. Um, I've also got some checkboxes, one to have different symbols for males and females. And, uh, others to fit some models, so I could fit a linear model here. Uh, notice this opens up a second part of the output panel. So as well as the graph on the right hand side, I've also got 
what you'll probably recognize if you use R as output from the model. Okay. So that's a fairly standard shiny setup. Um, just to sort of get you used to where the pieces are, uh, uh, which I'll go into when I look at the tutorials in the code. So in this case, our elements are um, drop-down boxes, sliders, uh, and check boxes. Uh, if I go back to R, you'll probably see lots of warnings or errors, which happen when you mess about with the application. They'll appear in the R window. And to get out of that, I'm just going to escape. So if I run a slightly different application, uh, let's run the diamonds application. You may recognize this data set because it's contained within the ggplot2 package. Um, here it is again, it's a similar setup. Um, I've got the uh, Diamonds Explorer title, which is the header panel. I've got the sidebar on the left. I've got the main panel on the right. Again, I've got sliders, uh, drop-down menus, and checkboxes. Uh, in this case, my output is the plot. So, for example, if I choose a couple of uh, quantitative variables, here I've got a data set of 54,000 different diamonds. I don't really want to be plotting 54,000 points. And therefore, I've got a sample size slider, so I can just plot 1,000 of the points or 4,000 of them. So it's a random sample I'm plotting. Okay. Uh, this data set has uh, a fairly large number of variables in it. Uh, the x-axis uh, at the moment is the carrot, which is the weight of the diamond. Uh, if I put a, something quantitative on the y-axis, so uh, let's put the price on the y-axis. Uh, you can see that obviously the price tends to increase uh, as the weight of the diamond increases. Uh, I've got a drop-down box where I can uh, select the colour. So uh, if, I, if I check the cut of the diamond, it will give different colours for the different diamond cuts going from fair to ideal. Uh, instead of doing different colours, I can do none, and I can put these in facets, and it will separate them uh, by colour. Um, so I'm not really showing you this for the actual examples, I'm just showing you this because I'm now going to go into how to create these types of things. Okay. And I want you to get the overall structure there, and the standard structure is to have these three elements. Uh, the header, which is just the title, the sidebar on the left, and the main panel on the right. Any questions so far? Good. Um, so let me go back to my R. Oh, I got some bits and pieces there. Let me just escape that. Okay, so let me go to the, the main part of the talk, which is actually go, um, leading you through some of the code. How do I create these applications myself? This is probably the question you're asking. And how you do that is you create a folder and you name that folder after the application you want. And within that folder you need two files. And one of the files you need to call ui.r and the second file you need to call it server.r. So ui is the user interface. That's where you specify your pieces in your web application. And a server is where you do all the work, all the R work, basically. And as I said, if you do know HTML or JavaScript, you can do more complicated things. I'm just sticking with R and fairly standard procedures. Uh, so a standard way of doing it here is in the UI.R file, you use the function shiny UI, UI uh, and then within that, you, you, you use the function page with sidebar. And the first argument is the header panel, the second argument is the sidebar panel, and the third argument is the main panel. Okay. And in fact, in the header panel, there's a header panel function which you can call here, and in the sidebar panel, there's a sidebar panel function, and the main panel, there's a main panel. In the server side of things, what you typically do is you use a function called shiny server, and within that, 
the function shiny server itself takes another function, and that function must have the two arguments input and output. Okay. It can have a third argument, which is called session, but I won't be talking about that today. So really, once you've got this structure down, you've really only got to specify four pieces in your application. You have to specify the header panel, the sidebar panel, and the main panel. That's for your UI.R. And you've got to specify the body of this function, which has the arguments input and output. Once you've got those four pieces, you can run your application. So I'm going to take you um, through these four pieces in uh, three tutorial examples. And we'll have a look at uh, how they work. Now, um, how do you actually run your example? I'll talk about this now while I'm here. To run an example, you use the function run app with a capital A, and in there you put the name of your folder. That's the folder that contains your ui.r file and your server.r file. There is also some examples contained within the R Shiny library itself, and if you want to run those directly, you can use the run example function. And that's what I'm going to do now. Okay. In fact, if I use the no arguments, it will tell you what examples exist. So I'm going to run the very first Hello World example. And it's this. So we'll go through the code in this example. It's probably one of the simplest examples you can come up with. Um, you can see uh, on the side panel, sorry, the sidebar panel, you've just got a single slider giving you a number of observations, and the output just consists of a single plot. The plot is a plot of uh, random uh, simulated values, in this case from a random normal distribution. Notice the default value of the slider is 500. It can go from zero, sorry, from one to 1,000 in any integer, so if I drag it to 886, it will replot my histogram using 886 uh, random simulated values. So that's pretty simple, but uh, we'll go through the code now, and it should give you an idea how to structure your um, examples. <coughs> Okay, so we need four bits for our Hello Shiny example. Header panel, sidebar panel, main panel, and the function body in the server.r file. So here's the three bits for the uh, user interface.r file. The header panel is easy peasy. Uh, it just consists of the title, that's it. So you've got header panel function, and you just put, in this case, Hello Shiny, and that will appear in your web browser as we previously saw as the title. The sidebar panel, we've seen in this case it's only got one element, so it's very simple. It's just got one slider. Okay? And that element corresponds to that function slider input. So if you use that function, you get a slider. We've got the minimum one, because it goes from one, maximum thousand, up to a thousand, and the value 500 is the default value, which we saw before. Number of observations is just what's written on the web application. Um, OBS is the identifier, or you can also call it the handler. So it, um, it identifies that slider to the rest of the code. And that's why it's in red. So that gives you your sidebar on your left-hand side, which is very simple, just a single slider. Your main panel, again, is just a single plot. Because it's a plot, you use the function plot output. And again, you give it an identifier, and you can give it what you want. In this case, it's called displot. So we've got two identifiers here. We've got obs, which is an input, which is on the slider, the slide, the sidebar panel, excuse me. And you have displot, which is an output, which in this case is your plot. 
that's fairly simple. So you're going to use those two things in your server.r function. So in the body of that function, where our arguments are input and output, we're going to use the obs, which relates to the slider, and the displot, which relates to the plotting output. Um, so the reason I'm saying input and output a lot is because notice the body of that function um, in the server.r file, the arguments to that function are input and output. Okay. So input is actually a list of your inputs, and output is a list of your outputs. So in this case, obs is an input and displot is an output. And basically, in your body of your server.r function, you need to specify what the output is. So let's have a look. And it's as simple as that. Okay. So output is the list. In this case, we're only defining a single element, which is displot. So we're defining an element of that list. Uh, we're using render plot, which is an R shiny function. Okay, to render plots. Um, and then you define your plot in here. So in this case, I'm using the R normal function because we were simulating normal random variables. Note that input is, is the list containing my inputs. It's obs because of the obs I used as an identifier previously. And so you simulate the random normal variables and you simply plot your histogram. So that's it. So if you go home, you open a folder, you call it what you like, um, you use these three slides uh, to construct those UI and server files. If you do run app and then your folder name, you will recreate that example exactly. Okay. So once you get the gist of these things and you try it with simple examples, um, quite quickly you pick up how it works and you can try more complicated examples and try it on your own data. Now this is a simple example, you've only got one input, you've only got one output, you've only got a single slider. So what I'm going to do now is to show you two a bit more complicated examples. So don't worry if you don't follow exactly what's going on in the code. Um, but I'm just going to point out pieces in the code and how they relate to the actual web app. Before I uh, do that, I'll, I'll just uh, cover this, which is what I went through before. So again, if you want to run examples which are already contained in Shiny, you can use the run example function. Uh, but most of the time, you'll be running uh, your own applications, in which case you use the uh, run app function as there. OK, so let's have a look at another uh, slightly more complicated example. OK, so let's look at the, the pieces of this. Again, your header panel is just your title, more widgets. Um, your left-hand side is your sidebar. Uh, you've got a, a drop-down list here to choose your, your data set. You can specify the number of observations to view in here. So if I put this down, you'll notice Eventually, sorry, if I update, click on the update view button, I'll only get three observations. Okay. I've got a note below that, and below that I've got an update view button. So in this case, it's not changing. Uh, when I change that, it only changes when I hit update view. We've got two types of output um, in the main panel. In the top, you'll notice that's... Um, output directly from R. So it's what the summary function returns, as I'm sure you've noticed. Okay. That's just verbatim output from R. Uh, in the uh, bottom right, we've got a tabular output of observations. And notice we've also got the titles, summary and observations. So we need that in our code as well, those section headers. <coughs> we've got choose a data set, then number of observations to view, a note and an update view button. So all these things are going to have to come into our code. So I want you to think about inputs and outputs here. What are my inputs and what are my outputs? 
I've got two outputs on the right hand side, which is your table and your summary. On the left hand side, you've got two inputs. You've got your data set and you've got the number of observations. So in this case, it's just uh, summaries uh, of different data sets. So let's have a look at the code and see how we go. OK, so the header panel is fairly obvious. It's just the title. Remember, in UI.R, we need to specify our header panel, our sidebar panel, and our main panel. The sidebar panel looks like this. It's a bit more complicated. Okay. We've got one, two, three, four elements. So the help text contains the text that you saw. It doesn't actually contain blah, 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 but it was quite long to get into the slide, so I just replaced it with blah, blah, blah. But that's the text you saw that was in between the submit button and the observation specification. Okay. That just puts the text in. You've got the submit button at the bottom which we saw as well. Um, you have select input, which gives you your checkboxes. Sorry, it doesn't give you your checkboxes. It gives you your drop-down menu, drop-down list. Okay. So you can only choose one of them. So again, we have choose a data set, which was what was written above the uh, menu. The choices for the menu and data set, in, you, in this case, is the identifier. You can write whatever you like in there. The numeric input um, is specified using the numeric input uh, function. Uh, again, number of observations to view is written just above that, and 10 is the default value. So when we opened it up first, it started with 10. So the thing to notice is that in our sidebar, we've got these four elements corresponding to the four functions. Select input, numeric input, help text, and submit button. The actual inputs um, you can see in red. So they're the identifiers for those inputs. So you have data set and you have ops. So, so they're the inputs. So that's the sidebar. Okay. We haven't got to the uh, main panel yet. So the main panel is coming up in the next slide. So here's the main panel. If any of you have used HTML, you may recognize H4. Um, as a tag, it just gives that section header. Okay. So H1 would be a very large section header. H2, H3 are progressively smaller. So that corresponds to the uh, H4 tag in HTML. So H4 summary gives you your, your uh, section header. For things like output from R functions, like direct output that's just put in the web application, you use the function verbatim text output. So in this case, in the server file, we're going to use the summary function to get the summary output. So in this case, uh, uh, we've called the identifier or the ID summary um, for that reason. But again, you can call it whatever. So verbatim text output is literally, it just puts the output of the R function onto the web uh, application. In terms of the observations, we had tabular output, and for that you use table output function. So there's our two outputs, summary and view. So our two inputs and our two outputs have to be used within our server.r file. So we've got the summary and the view uh, as our outputs. Uh, which is, was on the main panel on the right hand side and we've got the data set and the OBS as our inputs uh, which was in the sidebar panel. So the idea of the server.r uh, file is that when you specify the body of that function which has input and output as the arguments you need to define your output. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to define output dollar sign summary. And we need to define output dollar sign view. Okay. So that's the code for server.r. We 
which has to be put within the body of that function. So let's go straight down to the outputs. Output dollar sign summary and output dollar sign view. Because the, the summary section was just a, a verbatim text output, we're using the function render print here. And because the view identifier related to the tabular output, we're using render table. So if we go to output view, what are we doing? We're just doing render.table, and then we're printing in R um, the top of the uh, data frame. So head is just the standard R function. It just prints the, the first few rows of a data frame. It's not a shiny function. So head, what we're, call, we're calling a function called data set input, which is defined above. I'll talk about later. And then n, the number of uh, rows we want to print from the top of that data frame, uh, we use input dollar sign obs, because that was one of our inputs, the number of observations we want to show um, in that table. And here, again, we get the data set using data set input function, and we just take the summary. So our data set input is a bit more complicated. It uses the function called reactive, which is an R shiny function. Essentially derives from the fact that uh, the output reacts to changes in the input. Switch is not an R shiny function. It's a standard R function. It's actually not used that commonly, but it is there. It's the standard R function. Um, and here you're, um, you're using the um, data set input which is the type of data set you specify. Um, and in this case, you've got the data sets rock, pressure, and cards there. So in effect, you're, you're choosing your data set from that uh, function call. Reactive returns a function, I should have said that, which is why you have uh, open bracket and closed bracket here. Data set input is a function. So you can see here how the, the two inputs and the two outputs are, are working with each other. The observational input, number of observations, which only affects the table incidentally. Uh, the data set input, uh, which switches between the rock data set, the pressure data set, and the cars data set. And the summary output, uh, which is defined using render print. And that will print a, always print a summary of the entire data set. So if I go back, we can have a think about how that relates to this web application. So if I'm changing the number of observations to view, let's change it down, my tabular output changes once I update, but my summary doesn't because it uses the entire data set. Okay, so that's my second example. Let's go to a third example, and um, I, d I don't think this is more difficult necessarily, but it just gives you some slightly different elements that you can look at. So again, you can see the basic framework there, of a, a simple R shiny web app. Again, the header panel is just the title, tab sets. Um, in the sidebar now, we have some radio buttons, and we have a single slider, which is similar to what we had before. The main difference here is in our output, we actually have tabs. Um, so I can have a plot output here, or I can click on the tab and go to the summary output, which is just a, a verbatim output from R, or I can go to the tabular output here, which lists the actual data. 
So I can go from the actual data to the summary of the data to the plot. And this is a bit like the very first example we showed, except you can change the distribution that's simulated. So I can change from a normal to a uniform log normal exponential. And I can also change the number of observations. And again, the summary will change and the actual table of simulated values will change as well. So probably the main difference in the code here is going to be the, the tabs on the output. So again, have a think about the elements. We've got distribution type, number of observations, and then we've got plot, summary, table. So I'll show you uh, the code for this example. Uh, we start with UI.R, we've got the header panel, it's just the title tab sets. Uh, the sidebar consists of two elements, the radio buttons, which is the radio buttons function, fortunately, and the slider, which again you've seen before, that's the slider input. We've got BR, open bracket, close bracket, that just inserts a bit of a gap. Um, again, if you use HTML, you'll probably know that because BR is used for that purpose in HTML as well. So radio buttons, we've got distribution type, which is the string that appears on the web browser. Um, the identifier is a dist, again you can use whatever you like. And we've got the list. Um, so here, for example, normal will appear on your web browser. Uh, norm is, is based on the actual R function name. So, for example, the R function to simulate exponential distributions is R exp, hence the exp for exponential. Slider input you've seen before. Value is the default, and you also have a minute and a max. Um, again, by default, it will jump in units. So you can get it to jump in units of 100 or whatever. So that's uh, pretty straightforward, the sidebar panel. Uh, the main panel is probably the slight difference here um, because we have the tabs. So the function we use here is called tab set panel. And you see there are three calls to the function tab panel within the call to the function tab set panel. Okay. So each of those calls relates to a particular tab. And the first character string is what appears in the web browser on that tab. So plot, summary, and table are the actual things that appear on the web browser. Um, for the second argument, you actually put what you want to output within that tab. In this case, for a plot, you would use plot output. Um, for the summary, we're just using uh, verbatim text output. Again, we're going, to use, we're going to use the summary function in the server.r file for that purpose. Of course, you could use any other function that produces output the output of that function. Um, again, for table output, we use the table output function. So we've got three outputs here, one for each tab. And of course, you could have you know, two outputs within a single tab, if you wish. You don't have to do a one-to-one. -one. But in this case, we've got three outputs uh, and uh, three tabs. One output per tab. If I go back, what are our inputs? Our inputs are dist, which is the distribution type, and n, which is the number of observations. So in the server side, we see a similar kind of style to what we saw before. We need to actually specify our outputs. So we've got output dollar sign plot, output dollar sign summary, and output dollar sign table. For the plot, we use render plot. Uh, for verbatim output, we're using render print. And for tabular output, we're using render table. And you've seen all of them. In this case, we're using the data function, 
to produce the data. In render print, we're just using summary, which is the R function summary. A render table uh, uh, using the data.frame function. And in render plot, we're just using the hist function. Now, the data function is defined at the top. Again, we're using reactive and we're using switch. Okay. So we're relating those norm, unif, L norm, and exp things from the ui.r file, those are being used there to specify uh, the random function. Okay. Can we just have a look at that previous page? Just sure, no worries. Yeah, so, so this thing, <coughs> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. So, for example, where it says normal there with the capital N, that's what actually appears in the web browser. And that relates to this string norm here. And then, in turn, uh, that's relating to this norm here, which then relates to this R norm here. Okay. So, if you were, so then dist would become the function R norm, and then you would call R norm on that. The dollar dist select the actual I like a set to it, yeah. So those are the functions. So those are the, the really the basics uh, of doing uh, our shiny examples. And really the best way to learn is to have data sets of your own and then you know, have a play with your own web applications for your own data sets where your interest lies. And to go through some of the tutorials to get to get an idea of the things you can put in the web application. Um, you know, you're not going to get complete control over the web application. It, it's a fairly high level um, principle if you're just using R, um, but you can produce these things very quickly and very easily. So I'm going to show you a couple of applications that I came up with. The first application I'm going to show you is on a fire danger index maps. So bear with me one second. Maybe a bit out of scale, that's all right. Um, so this is a, an application where I can plot maps of fire danger in the city. So if you're told that it's a severe fire danger day, um, well that means the fire danger index is greater than 50. And the fire danger index is basically calculated using temperature, humidity, wind speed, and a dryness factor. So these are historical fire danger index maps. Um, so what have I got on my left hand side? Um, well I can, I can plot maps of any particular day. So for example, uh, if I just move my slider to the value 9, I'm plotting the map for the uh, 9th of September 2010. Okay. And uh, essentially red values are higher. The fire danger index is only meteorological, so you can get very high fire danger even when there's no vegetation. So it doesn't take into account vegetation or anything. That's why you often get fire, high fire danger and this is in the desert or something. Obviously you can't get fire. So the other thing I have on, on this slider, if you notice, is a little play button on the right hand side because you can anim have animated sliders. So if I click on pl play, it will cycle through the days okay, for each map. Now I'm plotting these things on the fly. So it will just cycle and plot and I can pause it there. Uh, I can do things like take the legend away there, or I can uh, show the title there. And so I'm using these checkboxes to alter the map. Okay. Uh, the other thing I can do is to plot states like that. Okay. Okay. 
So what you can do here is, you, I mean, you can go to particular days in the, in the past. So uh, if I go to, um, say, um, and I should say, if you're interested in this, you should read the technical notes. Um, but if you are interested in looking at you know, particular days from the past, you can just have a look, look them up. Um, uh, for example, if I go to something like, So that would be Black Saturday, for example. Um, so you see, with fire danger indices, you know, the danger is when you have very high values around them, when you have vegetation as well. Um, and indeed, I can animate any, any month uh, from going back to about 1960. So I think that's quite a nice example, and it shows you, um, you know, what you can do with visualization. I mean, it's a very simple sort of application, and really, I think the interest in applications is really the data you use, uh, rather than how simple the, uh, the web interface is. So I quite like this application. So the animation's just stepping through the data in the, within that frame that's been specified? Sorry, say that again? The animation is just stepping through that part of the data that's been specified. So yep. you specified the range for that part of the slider and the inputs, and it's just stepping through that. Well, I mean, this, so what I'm doing here is I'm step, stepping through a particular calendar month. So these are daily groups. So the slider just goes from 1 to 31. Yep. Okay. And it's calling on running each one sequentially or something. Uh, that's right, yeah. So every time the slider changes, it will sort of reactivate the plot. So you don't need to do that in a loop or anything. The, the R shiny will sort that out for you. Um, you only have to define it once, and then R shiny will do that in the background. Probably switching states is quite a bit more tricky uh, because you have to kind of get the uh, limits, x-axis and y-axis limits. But you can do it, and I mean you can do animations for particular states as well. Um, well, just animating New South Wales, for example. Um, so it's a nice app mapping application. How did you do the mapping there? Is it just putting it onto a plot and then plotting each dot individually, or is there pretty much? I mean, it's, pl it, it's really data, so it's really plotting yeah. coloured squares. But so you can't do stuff with shiny, like you know, using mapping polygons or anything like that. Yes, you can. I mean, I could easily plot the exterior of, of, and the state borders. Um, the problem is it takes time. Yeah. Uh, so it's pretty useless if you're doing animation because you'll be waiting, you know, 10 seconds for each, um, for each bit because, um, well, if you have a detailed border, it takes time. Yeah. There is functions where you can kind of simplify geographical borders. Does it need to redraw every frame or could you have the borders on your blocks? Good question. You, I mean, you probably need to do every frame. I'm not sure. You may be able to work out a way of doing. Where does it take ages? Yeah, you may be able to work out a way of doing. I mean, probably a better idea is there is actually a function whose name I forget now, which you can take a spatial polygon and you have to simplify it. Because if you download like the state borders from the ABS website, you'll find they're very detailed, so it takes a long time to plot. And every plot is, is quite large. Um, and so you really need to simplify that, those, those borders, or those spatial borders. How do you make sure that the chat is put to that window? Do you have to specify size? So if I have a big table that runs out, doesn't adjust the size? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I mean, I didn't do anything explicitly. If you adjust your, I won't do it here because it's, it's a bit fiddly, but. If you adjust the web browser, the actual the, the, the ratio will change. So it's not a fixed ratio. So if you actually put your window as a you know, long rectangle, the, the, the map would look very strange. So I'm kind of leaving up to the user to, to specify their window correctly so it looks reasonable. So I'm not fixing any ratios, right? But is it possible? Um, 
it, it probably is possible. Um, this is available as a, as a demo, or is this a private this particular application? You can play with it yourself. I'll give you the uh, web uh, link in the panel down. Um, so the second example, any, any more questions on that? Before I move on? So the second example is slightly different. So you see here the, the plots are being made on the fly. I'm going to compare that with this example. I'm just going to show you now, which also has plots, but it's done in a slightly different way. It's going to come up on here. That's right. So this is actually a really simple in terms of a web application. I've just got a single slider on the left-hand side. That's it. So what I've got here is a slider that goes from 0 to 11. So all I've got is 12 plots. So in this case, I'm not plotting these on the fly. What I'm doing is I've just stored the 12 images, and it's just showing the images as I move the slider. So if you actually do plot networks of this size, it actually takes a long time. And that's not because of the actual plot, it's usually because um, it uses an algorithm to decide where to put the nodes. And it's that that takes a long time. So take, if you specify quite a complex algorithm, it can take a long time to decide where to put the nodes in the network, or where to plot the nodes in the network. So a network is just defined by its nodes and its edges. Uh, so in this case, each of these little nodes is a CSIRO scientist. Okay. And you've got an edge between two nodes. If those two scientists have written a publication together since 2011 in the publicly available research for publications repository. Okay. So this is sometimes called a co-authorship network. Basically, you've got authors, so your nodes are your authors, and there's a link between the nodes if those two authors have, have, have done a work together or done a publication together. And I've also coloured them by the division um, within CSIRO. So this presents a bit of a problem because there's 11 divisions and it's very difficult to um, highlight particular divisions and get a set of 11 colours where you know, they're distinct but on the other hand where one colour doesn't stand out from the other colours. So what I've done here is that I've got a basic uh, network here and then when I move my slider I change one of the division's colour to black. Okay. And in doing so, I can then highlight any particular division I want in that plot. And I think that's quite nice. It's very simple, but I think it's quite a nice idea. Okay. So then you can see um, the scientists from each division and how they relate to this network. And my division's at the end here, 11. So I'm probably one of those black nodes there in that network somewhere. So again, you, know, you could do this using PowerPoint slides or something. Um, but you can do it in, R, in no time at all, really, using R Shiny. And you know, I think it's a, a, a nice way to communicate and, and visualize what's going on. Uh, so uh, last comment from me is, Um, have a go with your own data. I run these locally, but you can put your applications on a web server. Okay, so you can try and do your own web server, or RStudio has a, a beta version of a web server that you can use if you send them an email and ask nicely. And all the information is on their website. So these two applications I have put on the server, which means you can play around with them yourself, and you just need to go to that link or that link. So the first link is for the fire danger stuff, and the second link is uh, the uh, network stuff, the co-authorship network. So feel free to have a play around with those two applications yourself. So put it on the server, what does that entail? Putting the R on that server and then... Yeah, I'm not sure because I use their server, so... I mean, I, you know, it's just a standard uh, link to their server and put your 
you know, putting your folder and putting your information on. But actually setting up a server, I'm not quite oh, sure. Well, not so much the setting up the server, but what you need to put in, in terms of the R, uh, R stuff on the server to get it work with to get. Uh, oh, that's pretty simple. I mean, so these here, like at the end, you've got Fire and SNet. Those are just your folders. So within that Fire folder, mm -hmm. you would have your UI.R file and your server.r. I just imagine you have to have R sitting somewhere on that server as well to be able to serve up those files. Sure, I mean, that's, I mean they, they, they set up the server and do that for you, so you don't have to, if it's somebody else's server, you don't have to worry about that. If you're setting up your own server, then you have to worry about that. Um, so that's it. Oh, and of course, I mean, the other thing I haven't mentioned is you've got to make sure if you're using data, then the data is there as well. So in the examples I used, for example, the Diamonds data set was within the library ggplot2. Um, the, some of the other data sets were in a CSV file within the folder. Um, so you have to make sure the data is available for the applications you use. Um, uh, uh, do, you, do you have to set up that data inside that, um, that server file? Yeah, you have to put it on the server if you're using the server. No, I mean that server that are. Um, I know, well, no, you, I mean you have to, you have you might have the data in separate files, but then you 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 need to sort of load in the data from that server.r file, just like you would in any normal R session. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you just, you didn't have like specific references to the the example files or whatever, all the stuff that's already encapsulated in R. It's just got access to them yeah, through its right. own internal mechanisms. I'm sure that would be the same on the server. Yeah, yeah I imagine so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, some of the examples use simulated data, in which case it's not an issue because you're just simulating the data directly in R. So yeah, there are different ways of using data. And sometimes the data is contained within a, um, a package, in which case you just load in that package and you've got the data available. So it depends on where you're getting the data from. So um, just to be very clear, um, you can host it yourself. So you could, you could have all your data um, on your own PC and, and run it and use that as an example to show someone you don't have to have access to the web to be able to um, run the example. Yes, I think that's right. Yeah. Um, and in, in terms of distributing or having a product to distribute, say you wanted, say you've done an analysis and you wanted to distribute that to your colleagues internally, um, you either have to post it on a, a server post it through our studio or um, perform the example yourself and say, all right, here's, you know, I've loaded R, I've put all my data in, I've opened up the shiny example, here it is, go and play with it. Is that yes, I would agree. So um, I think I will finish there. Thank you very much. <laughs>
what might be the best applications I mean, that's a good question. Right. I think basically um, the target audience is somebody that sort of wants to build web apps, not necessarily very complex web apps, but only knows R, or maybe knows some JavaScript, some HTML. It's certainly not for expert you know, web app developers who probably wouldn't even think of using R. Um, but it's certainly, you know, for, for me, you know, I'm, I know R, and I can do these things quickly. You know, I don't need you know, a level of, of, of detail that um, would mean me asking somebody else to do it for me. Um, and so I can use R to, to do you know, fairly simple apps fairly quickly. I, I think it um, I would, uh, would fill a good niche in terms of um, uh, interactive ad hoc presentations of data. And if you wanted to actually publish it, you should probably use it to move it to another platform. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I think it would be very good for kind of visualising things to other people and communicating it. I think it would be good for teaching as well. Mm -hmm. Teaching things like central limit theorem would be very easy yeah. to do that. You can take it to a presentation on your laptop and you know, it doesn't have to be on the web and that's actually a good thing because you're not on the network right now, for instance. That's right. Yeah. Having said that though, um, you can do a lot more with, if you use HTML to write the front end rather than using the UI.r yeah. file, you can actually make really quite complex web apps that have, are doing all of the back end processing and stuff but still have you know, all the things that you can do with JavaScript and HTML as well for, you know, making it look good. You go yeah. look at the audience, I think this is for people who not, don't know HTML. Um, if you know about HTML, you should have a look at D3. Oh, but still, like Hush on instruction, you yeah. can do quite a lot in terms of presentation and actual kind of professional looking web apps. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If you use HTML front ends and then use, I uh, can do the heavy lifting with the statistics and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with that. I mean, when I'm giving this talk, I'm really talking about you know, using only R to build web apps, rather than you know, using, uh, as you say, using HTML and, and, and R as a sort of back end. So, um, so you know, I would agree, you can make very complex web apps if you integrate R with uh, you know, other tools. Another application that we're working on is automating simple analytical tasks. Mm -hmm. So we have a instead of going in the spreadsheet and manipulating a file, you can create an app that does whatever manipulation with your sliders, choices of files, okay. variable choices, if you, and then your internal um, people can go and click, and you know it's going to be, they're not messing with your code or operating their own code, you know exactly what's being done. So that's in, in that space, it's, that's where I'm finding it's really uh, has a lot of potential, I think. Um, I think on your map example you had a download button. Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing that's you can download a big, uh, the PNG or something. Yeah, you can download it. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. I think I think it's PNG. Yeah. If you just click on the download, you'll get a PNG file. So you, on if you're trying to distribute analytics to somebody who uh, was a lay user or something or didn't know R, you could could you have like an R example that you double clicked and you pre told Windows or something to open up R and run it and then it it's going to pop up with the web app and then they can step through things and there might be a download button on there that they can save the picture from it or something. Yeah, you could try and do that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean, it's, it's, yeah, you could, I mean, I, you know, as I say, I, I probably haven't, you know, looked into exactly what it can do. I, I imagine, you know, you can do most things if you look hard enough. So, yeah, it would be a good idea to, to Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alex.